Welcome friends near and far. Can you hear us on the internet world? Yay, so nice to see everyone. So we'll go ahead and get started here in just a moment, a couple arrangements. For folks who are joining us maybe for the first time or haven't seen our new beautiful um, decorations here. There's been a lot of effort put into beautifying the space recently. Just really want to appreciate Brendan and Tig, just amazing, and Noam doing so much work to make this such a lovely space to sit in. For those of you sitting here, there are, I think, other cushions in the back as well. If you'd like a cushion, you're welcome to sit or I, I don't think there's enough room to lay down, stand. Are there SFDC announcements that want to happen before we get started? No, okay, I'll announce. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, friends. Nice to be here. I'm just so delighted. We have special edition with Ryan Redman. Woohoo! So uh, don't tell anybody sitting in the teacher training about 45 minutes south of here, we escaped <laughs> for the night. So Venerable Tenzin is teaching on compassion and we came up here um, to be with you all, which is really exciting. So we're four days into the Cultivating Emotional Balance teacher training and such a sweet time. Our retreatants are about their second day into silence, it's really calm. So we got to just, jangle up our nervous system coming down to the Mission District. And he's, a, he's a real troublemaker. I am, yeah. He's always breaking out of the, the retreat walls, so <laughs> I feel <Thank> guilty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, Ryan and I have been teaching together going on eight or nine years and leading this teacher training together for three years. He's coming to us from Sun Valley, Idaho, and we have Paige also, Sun Valley, Idaho, woohoo, online. So we are um, really fortunate to have him here in person. I think the last time Ryan taught with us was in 2019, 18. We did a two-day CEB at the Dharma Collective, so really wonderful to be back. And for those of you who might be new to the Dharma Collective or familiar to the Dharma Collective, just a reminder that this is a volunteer-run space that this place literally exists on the gratitude and tension and um, care of so many people who are in this room and online with us. And one of the priorities of the Dharma Collective is to create a collective space that feels welcoming, um, that feels like we can um, be here together and deepen our practice. So some of the values we really prioritize is having a compassionate speech and a compassionate listening to one another. So recognizing that we may not be aware of what's going on. Well, we are certainly not aware of what's going on with everybody else in this room. So when we invite conversation and discussion to really keep in mind that everything we're gonna do tonight is the practice, not just the formal meditation, but also how we engage with one another. So it's a real goal for us to create a space that feels inviting and, and welcoming. I'd love to say we could create a space that felt safe, but I think that's an individual experience. That's our aspiration, of course. One thing we'd love is if folks have ideas or feedback for us and how we can make the space more welcoming, we'd love that. That's such a priority um, to create a center that really feels um, safe and spacious and enjoyable, fun, right? If this isn't fun, it's gonna be really hard for us to keep on this path to waking up because it's a lot of work. So tonight we're going to dive into the themes of fear and empathetic joy. So we're taking a bit of a page from the book of Cultivating Emotional Balance. Some of you know is an evidence-based training. I've been teaching for almost 13 years. Really, really honored to be holding that, that training. And it really draws together these wisdom streams of contemporary Western psychology and traditional uh, Tibetan-based Buddhism in a secular training to help us really have choice in how we respond to our emotions, to be able to cultivate our minds and hearts so we can be of service to others. 
So with that enormous preamble, I'm gonna hand it off to my friend and colleague, Ryan, to get us started with a meditation and some thoughts. Hmm. Today, I was, as Eve mentioned, we were going into silence with a group that we're working with and I was, I was doing a, a compassion practice and, and thinking to myself in my compassion practice of how do we spread Dharma in the world, in a world that feels <clears throat> at some times so resistant and reluctant to teachings on Dharma? And I mean, I guess I'll just step back for a moment and say, what is Dharma? You know, how do we define that term? And for me, Dharma means it's a way of viewing and engaging with reality that supports our own and others' well being. So I really like that frame because there's so many things that could be Dharma. Mm. And really thinking about how do we facilitate a ground where we can sow seeds for this type of worldview to really take hold, to gain traction. And so I was thinking about this in my meditation and there are many times, um, you said I, meant I, I live in Idaho and at times it feels like there's not a lot of Dharma going on in Idaho. You know, even just coming into a space like this and seeing, you know, people tuning in online is, is so encouraging, so inspiring. And when I was thinking about it today, and I was really kind of thinking about the laws of cause and effect and how that maybe plays into creating a world of Dharma and really what came to my heart was continuing to create centers and spaces where mm. people can convene and talk about the Dharma is the way that we sow seeds to continue perpetuating the Dharma. Mm. And so it's super cool to be here. Eve talks about you all like her second family, <laughs> you know, so I um, just really delighted that you invited me to be here. And something you said in the introduction, which I think will be a, a nice frame for the practice this evening, is fun is an important part on the path to awakening. And this is not some kind of new age idea that we're bringing in because we want to, you know, like make it a little softer so that, you know, we can attract more people and fill up all the chairs and this is a this is a teaching as far as i know that one one source that i'm thinking of goes back to the 8th century shanti deva a great nalanda master a teacher in in india he talks about how do we cultivate this unwavering joyful effort mm. to really proceed along this path of awakening awakening not only to our own highest potential, but awakening our capacity to serve others fully. And one of the things that he suggests, he suggests several things. One of the things he suggests is really be clear about your aspirations, your intentions. So I think many people practicing the Dharma, that's, that's very common. It's an invitation for us to really sink in and root into why am I here? Mm. Is this just a practice to calm my mind or how do I see this fitting into the larger framework of my life? But one area he talks about that often I know for myself, I was saying the, the people maybe on the screen can't see this, but the people here who are live, I was saying this today to a group. I was saying, boy, I've practiced a lot of Dharma and not had fun. And I've got this, what I call a meditation scar right here. And many of you could probably see this, but it's really from digging in and striving and really, you know, wanting to, to kind of conquer awakening through just sheer <laughs> effort. And boy, have I really learned that this, this piece of how do we bring in joy? And Shanti Deva really highlights this. He says, if we're gonna continue this path, especially the Bodhisattva path is the context he's writing it in. And the Bodhisattva path from, for I think many people who are here, and I know you've been with Eve and Chandra, amazing teachers. But the Bodhisattva path is, is it's paramount, mm. it's enormous. 
thinking about how do I realize my own perfect awakening for the sake of all beings? We're having a kind of aspiration from now until samsara is emptied. My strive for the benefit of all beings who have all been my mother. This enormous prospect, all beings, not just human beings. There's many. When you look around the world, you think, oh, God, there's so many human beings. And then all beings, all living beings. And I think this advice from Shantideva, just pointing us back to joy, is so essential. And it's a part, honestly, that I am just now tapping into and, and getting into. So I know the words that I'm sharing, they're, they're the words that I really need to hear. And I, and I hope that the, the practice that we do this evening and then the conversation that we have will really be inspiring and useful to, to think about joy, not as a way of letting ourselves off the hook, but really as the authentic fuel to carry us in this extraordinary, they call it the great vehicle, the Mahayana, mm. this great path of, of cultivating deep transformation for the sake of all beings. So with that being said, we're gonna go into a practice of cultivating joy and we'll do this first intimately in a very personal way and just tuning into the, the places and parts in our body, in this space, this collective that you, you've created here so beautifully and see, can I just tap into some momentary expressions of pleasure, of goodness, and just start to kind of tune in that way and then setting the stage there, we'll go into a practice that is very traditional. It's called murita, which just means it's, it's often translated as empathetic joy. And we'll bring people to mind who inspire us in different ways. And since Eve brought up this fun toward the path of awakening, to maybe think about who are the folks that really inspire us with their joy mm. on this path and delight in that because what we appreciate in that regard as a as a, a wonderful teacher who actually lives here in the bay area lynn twist she, i wouldn't consider her a dharma teacher but um, works in the world of philanthropy but i think she says something that's really powerful is what we appreciate appreciates. And this is kind of the, the, in Buddhism, they say this is like the lazy way to get virtue, <laughs> to cultivate so seeds of good karma is to arouse this deep appreciation for others' virtuous acts. And just by doing that, we accrue some of the benefit of that and we create this momentum in our own practice and we start to build that. And then hopefully it also develops an inspiration for us to continue on this extraordinary path of, of awakening. So enough preamble. I, I don't know. I hope that wasn't too long. That was great. Okay. <laughs> He's always reeling me in. I'm terrible at keeping it brief, short set. You know, if you want to share a few opening remarks. So there you have it. Those are my opening remarks. And I apologize. It's out of passion and fun. I know. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in there. So, What's that? It's suffering, death, and fun. <laughs> <laughs> suffering, death, and fun, the fifth noble truth that we often forget about. <laughs> so with that being said, let's, um, let's start with a meditation. And I invite you to find a comfortable position if you're not there already. And choosing for yourself whether it feels more accommodating, more relaxing to keep the eyes open or if you prefer to close the eyes. And really as an act of generosity the first of the six perfections in this great path of Mahayana. 
generously allow yourself the time and space to initiate a process of relaxation. We can begin this process by bringing awareness to the immediate experience of the body. And touch into the variety of sensations and feelings that are present this evening in the body. And while deepening this connection to the lived experience of the body, we may naturally begin to discern that there are parts of the body that feel at ease and relaxed while other parts of the body may feel contracted or tight. And for a moment, I invite you to bring attention to any parts of the body that feel contracted or tight. As you bring attention to such a place, explore within yourself, what is it like <clears throat> to breathe in and allow for a kind of expansion and openness and to breathe out and facilitate a relaxation or a quality of releasing and letting go. If you find this helpful, give yourself another minute or so to scan the body, opening and releasing with each cycle of the breath. And along with this deepening sense of relaxation, give yourself the gift of dropping into stillness. And for now, in this context, stillness is not necessarily resisting an impulse to move. But let stillness be more of a recognition of having nowhere else to go and nothing else to do. Reclaim the simplicity of being.
And now upon this integration of relaxation and stillness, maintain a quality of wakefulness. See if you can arouse a genuine sense of curiosity, recognizing the favorable conditions that have come together, giving us an opportunity to explore and cultivate joy in our body, heart, and mind. And with this curiosity, let your awareness become more diffuse. Open your awareness to whatever is happening moment to moment in the five physical senses. I'm not directing our attention to anything but see what simply rises up to meet awareness. And we may notice different sounds, bodily sensations, visual impressions, other sensory stimuli. And with what is being dished up moment to moment, bring a special kind of interest and see on occasion, is there any pleasant feeling that arises in relationship to a sensory impression. It could be the mild pleasure of sitting on a soft cushion or in a chair. And for now, if you discover a pleasant feeling, notice what is it like to simply highlight that with attention. So we're not grasping, holding tightly to it, but just simply acknowledging it. And if it's difficult for you to apprehend a pleasant feeling, you can look for a neutral feeling, which is neither pleasant or unpleasant. And by attending to both neutral and pleasant feelings, can you very gently reveal an aspect of reality that is either okay or that is momentarily good?
And from this place, what is it like to, again, come back to observing the entire, entire array of bodily sensations? And for just a minute, in this array of sensations, if it's comfortable for you to bring your attention to the breath and let that be an object of attention, if there's another sensory stimulus that you prefer to attend to, let your awareness rest there. And again, it could just be resting upon a neutral or pleasant feeling. whatever you prefer. And now with a receptivity for delight and appreciation, give yourself a moment to reflect upon an individual who inspires you along the path of spiritual awakening. with their joy. So who naturally comes to heart and mind for you? And using the power of your imagination, what is it like to envision this person in front of you? And if it's difficult to imagine, 
can you invoke this person through a felt sense of their presence? And now with this person in mind, actively begin to bring forth a sense of appreciation and delight for the joy that this person expresses. Know that in, in appreciating this person's joy, we are sowing seeds in our own mind stream. To experience joy along our own spiritual path. If it's helpful, you can breathe out a sense of appreciation, of thanks, of delight. To the best of your ability, try to enlist these qualities appreciation and delight through the body. So it's not just a cognitive process, but can we start to feel the experience of rejoice? Perhaps there's a particular situation or a circumstance that really comes to mind that you can associate with this person, making this appreciation more specific. Quite possibly after a while, holding this imagery may become effortful. In which case, is it possible to simply delight upon the experience of joy?
You're muted, Eve. Okay, can you hear me now? Could you hear us for the practice? Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Phew. Relief, such an enjoyable emotion. Um, yeah, any questions or reflections from folks online or in person on that practice? Yes. Yeah, I think funny about something about joy and things. Those teachers don't really do general. Super magnified, I guess. Yeah. I don't want to say all or most much, but. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the reflection is that fun, not always the front of the mind um, among many Dharma talks or Dharma teachers, and an unnamed center maybe was uh, <laughs> highlighted as maybe not the place where fun is front and center. And you know, talking about it is like a criticism. No. Exactly, you know, it's yeah. Like yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's an interesting observation. You know, I think that there's, um, especially in, in certain forms of, of Buddhist practice, I'd say too, really, all right, let's, let's get everything out of the way so that we can focus on this insanity of our mind. And fun is just one of those things that can be a distraction, right? If it's not used with the intention for really tenderizing the heart. And I, I often think of especially empathetic joy practice. It's like the wind underneath our wings. It's not that we have to flap. It's that we get a little lift. Not so that we then, you know, overindulge in things that might be harmful, but so that we can keep going. And, you know, it's this, I think, um, Brian was saying it's like this just amazing double benefit where we bring to mind someone who is inspiring to us and we feel good. We didn't have to do the work, right? Like they lift us up. There's something really incredible about that. And especially with empathetic joy practice, it really helps us feel connected. So it's interesting when I think of fun, there's definitely fun things you can do on your own. But when I think of joy, I really do think of connection, right? There's, there is a joy that comes from getting clearer on the true causes of suffering. And there's also a joy and sense of real, um, yeah, just kind of um, lightheartedness that can happen when we feel at ease. And to highlight that, it's helpful and it's needed. Uh, and I might use that as a tiny segue to why we're talking about fear tonight alongside joy. Like, why would we do that? That's like, you know, is that like peanut butter and pickles? It's only a couple people are interested. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'd say I've never tried peanut butter and pickles. So I'm, I'm not trying to defame, but um, our fear right? That feeling of fear when we are trying to work with it. So that's our low level anxiety we just wake up with. That's the hit we get if we look at or listen to the news. And then we just start ruminating or perseverating on so many things that deserve our fear. And when we try to work with that, we can't just say, stop it. Don't be afraid. That, that's not that helpful, right? Like, no, 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 not fear. But when we meet fear with, you're not alone, there's a little more buoyancy there, right? It's not, don't be afraid, or there's no reason to be afraid, or don't worry about, you know, total species extinction just yet, right? And it's like, that's not comforting. But then you're not alone. 
And I think a practice of empathetic joy reminds us not only are we not alone, but we're surrounded by the goodness of others. So it's, it's interesting because empathetic joy is usually a practice used to combat jealousy, envy, which also we need a lot of, right? So here we are looking at social media or the news and we're like, man, um, or that would be envy really. It's like, I really, I really want the way these other people are living. That looks good. I want that. And instead of that feeling of maybe contraction of why do they have it? I want it. We think, wow, how wonderful, how great. I can rejoice in the goodness. Like I heard this little girl maybe um, outside during the, during the meditation, like a little squeal, and I imagined her mom embracing her. Empathetic joy. Like we can feel good about that goodness around us. So that's a little, a little kickoff. Do I see a raised hand? You do. Um, I, we were Great. hoping that somebody, that when people want to speak at the center, they could come up and use the mic, or Eve, if you'd be kind enough to repeat exactly what they said, because it's a little bit garbled and distorted. We can't make yes. it. Yes, I'll repeat the last thing. So I hope I will keep doing that. Absolutely. Thank you. For COVID precautions, I might not do that tonight. We're at kind of a surge at this moment, I'm trying to stay healthy. Any questions or reflections on just that first piece of empathetic joy and fear before I hand the baton over to Ryan for some thoughts? Yeah. Um, I just, when you said we're going to be thinking about joy and fear, I immediately felt like, ah, yes, that, those are the two things happening to me right there. Mm. Inability to feel the empathetic joy because of my fear. Mm. And what was really cool about the practice was that I felt um, myself as plastic. <laughs> and it started here and then it sort of started going through my chest. And it was a little bit hard to get there because the fear part was just like, Joel, do it. Mm. Yeah. But, just go there. but um, it was really cool to actually feel it physically happening. I think usually when I think about an experience of joy, it's more like sudden, and I don't sort of mm. think about like how it's actually arising mm. and moving. And so mm. Yeah. Mm. So the the reflection was on noticing that when prompted that tonight would be about joy and fear, the response was, oh yes, both of those are here. And there was a palpable sense of the fear during the practice that actually had to kind of defrost in order for that warmth of joy to emerge. Um, and that was a really kind of unique to feel that arising. And such a great description of how fear is so much in our body mm -hmm. and listening to you Eve and your remarks and thinking how often do we hear that of like just casually like don't worry about it you know and if it was that easy like oh thanks Eve <laughs> that's really oh gosh I'm so glad I have you around it makes so much sense why didn't I think of that sooner but we can say that we can even think that like I know I'm safe I can look around in this moment, or I know like there's the worry is not helping me. I know that cognitively, but fear just gets so encrusted mm. in our body. And I love this, just your description of it, just like slowly starting to thaw just a little bit, mm. you know, and, and I know from my, my own journey and in, in working with fear, which I have a lot of, <laughs> you know, I've fear, I have to say has been a, a great teacher. I'm still humbled by it frequently. In fact, this last week, I'm, I'm looking up at one of the squares and seeing my wife. And I was thinking, um, maybe almost this exact time last week, we were, it was, it was midnight and, and our 13 year old son jumped into bed with us. And he, it seemed like he was having a panicked attack for the first mm -hmm. time. And he even reflected shortly after, he said, 
to my wife, he said, mom, is, is this what a panic attack is like? Mm. And so he was having this response. And then I started to get super afraid that I couldn't support him. Mm. You know, I was like, oh my God, I'm, his, I'm, I'm like supposed to be his support. I'm supposed to be his dad. Like, when did this happen? And I was, I was starting to empathically feel his resonance of fear and then building my own story around that of like, oh my God, what do we do? How do we stop this? And we were, you know, we were trying all these different things. And I know for myself, the, the one lifeline that I had was the thing we did in the very beginning of coming back into my body and just saying, can I notice anything pleasant? And at that time, I really couldn't. It was really hard because my body was so in the grip of fear that it was like, what's neutral? Mm. And, and by doing that, it just kind of made the shift of like, yes, this is an intense situation. And there's still a small part of me that I can, and you mentioned this the other day, Eve, we were walking through San Francisco of learning how to trust ourselves. Mm. And there was a small part I could trust in that was okay. And I could just be anchored there. And it was remarkable to go through this process with him and hold that space. And it wasn't like, you know, we talked him out of it, but it was just holding that resonance eventually kind of gave him the confidence because we were, you know, we weren't freaking out. It was on the verge of it, but it, mm. it kind of helped that energy eventually settle in his body but it was like a falling out kind of process it just didn't happen and there was no words to say yeah don't worry about it you know you don't just let the fear go it was it it just lives so much in our bodies and i think about this and you know i i, I appreciate your reflection earlier of like why isn't this mentioned more you know like what why is it this kind of this this like really effortful approach and it's there this idea of of joy and bringing that just playfulness is a really beautiful word that could come up and it is there i i i mean one translation of the the fourth of the six perfections, so I mentioned generosity being the first, is virya, which is this enthusiasm. This, and some people, you know, I, I think Western translators, they, they can't get away quite from the effort, so we call it joyful effort. <laughs> you know, but it should just be joy. It doesn't have to be, there's no, the word, it doesn't have to necessarily be this kind of effortful joy but this joy, and then also in another place that it comes up that I've thought about a lot is there's a beautiful teaching in looking at what are the, the different obstacles to really settling our mind. And there's a list in, in Buddhism, those of you that, that study Buddhism, you, you have to like lists <laughs> because there's, a, there's like within that list and it breaks out into five other lists and it's like oh my god but there's a list of what's called the five obscurations and they obscure our capacity for really attending clearly to whatever is in front of us but also to opening our hearts completely and one of the five obscurations is worry and anxiety and they say the metaphor they often use is like if we if our mind when it when it's free of the obscurations is like a clear pool of water mm -hmm. and and i live up in the mountains in idaho and often we go to the lakes in the summer and there's some days when the water is so still that if you take a picture it, you know you show someone the picture and you turn it upside down you don't know which one is the reflection because it's just so clear. And so when the mind is settled, it's said to, to be, it has this incredibly illuminating, or the word that often comes up is just limpid. It's just anything that hits it, it's just brightly illuminated. But when it's covered up by these obscurations, and particularly anxiety and worry, 
It's said to be like water that's whipped by the wind. Mm. And it kind of feels like that viscerally when we're, in, we're caught in fear. It just feels like there's this windstorm going through our bodies. And they say that these are balanced by what are called these, the, the technical term is dhyana factor. So each of these has kind of a natural antidote built into it that comes up through practice. And the one that is said to really attenuate, to alleviate, to diminish this, this fear or this anxiety and worry is pretty, is what it's called. And pretty just means joy. And so, of course, in an ideal situation, our meditation is just going beautifully and joy is just spontaneously arising. And it gives us that, that anchor of like, yes, things are difficult and there's goodness that I can, I can continue to be nourished by that's coming from the inside. Mm. But we can also cultivate it and we can start to deliberately arouse it just like we did in this practice. And so it is there. Mm. And when we think about like our, our situation where there is kind of a, there's, as Eve mentioned, there's so many things to be anxious about. If, if you're not anxious, it's almost like you're not paying attention. And yet, how do we support ourselves so that we don't just become single-minded or single-pointed around all that's going wrong? Mm with leaving out this very important aspect of reality that we can choose and select in just by a matter of our attention and literally choose that, bring that to bear so that we can thaw, we can thaw this experience and allow ourselves to open up a bit. And, and it's like, when I think of frozen, it just doesn't move. And when, you know, it's like ice thawing out, it's this, this beautiful liquid, fluid mobility. Mm. So I, I, I really think that it's worthy of consideration, even mm. if they're not top Dharma centers aren't mm. espousing this. Uh, it's right there in the teachings. Mm. And, I, and I, honestly, I can't imagine why it's, it's kind of overlooked. And even if, you know, we talk about it, it's kind of like, Really? I came here to talk about joy. Let's get to like, let's get to suffering and then <laughs> compassion. You know, compassion is strong because it's, it's recognizing suffering. Mm. But joy is the, the ally of compassion. Mm. When compassion falls into despair, yeah. it's joy is what picks it up and gives us its, its wings again. So very, I think, relevant. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, questions, reflections, wind whipped waters of your mind that want to <laughs> be understood or explored? Yeah, um, thank you so much for bringing that bringing in the um, obscurations, because I, lo I love those. It's the analogies, the metaphors are so beautiful and so palpable. Um, and I've always found them to be really, uh, uh, provide a, a real focusing for me to, again, to kind of, and I was trying to explain this to someone, I was trying to explain like the pools of water. I wish you had been there to do this. <laughs> you would, they would have been much more clear on it than, because I was like, okay, what am I going to oh, say at one time? And uh, try to put all this together. But I really feel like, yes, joy gets overlooked. And to me, it's like, it's, you, it has to be there. It has to be present for me to, to quell that fear and be able to feel that compassion, it's, it's right in there because it's the, it's the obverse of suffering. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it, it is in there in the Four Noble Truths. It's, it could be phrased, I think someone else mm -hmm. might have said it, it, it completely in the other direction and it would still be powerful. Um, but, I, but it's not, so maybe that's why. Mm -hmm. But uh, thank you so much. It's mm -hmm. just you're really so clarifying. Mm. Really appreciate that. Mm. Good, thank, thank you. you. 
Did you all hear online? It was an emphatic endorsement of joy. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we're saying joy, right? But most of us do hear this term as empathetic joy. And I had the funny little gig uh, the other day to go on NPR as a meditation teacher. I put that in air quotes because I, I could, I get, I get called a lot of funny names. Um, and it was with a, a, a researcher who's studying positive empathy. So happily, there's a growing interest in when we can have the contagious feeling from others that feels good. Right. So when we think of joy, it doesn't only have to be something that's welling up from inside. Wonderful. But also what wells up and in, from inside when we meet with the world and we meet with the goodness of others. And that kind of just two weeks ago when I was sharing space with you all and we were resonating deeply in the despair of the world. Right. And how to hold an open heart, the kind of empathic distress for what's going on around us. And I think all of these are, um, you know, they're all parts of how we are able to respond and how we're able to kind of find some energy to I, I do want to stick up for fear a little bit as well. Um, I also, I think I am like a total expert in feeling fear. Um, and I think one of my, my biggest obstacles with fear is, is making it wrong and trying to get rid of it or feeling like I should be different around it. And we think of fear and it's just this incredibly basic and simple response to threat. And it's really helpful. A little bit of fear is how most of us have accomplished things in our life. Like, oh God, I got to get this done. And then we do. And it's so interesting, again, just drawing in some of the contemporary threads. If we treat fear as a useful tool, and we think of it even as, God, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm stressed. Oh, this is going to help me. This is actually going to help me right now. It literally benefits us more than if we're like, I'm so stressed, this is so hard, this is terrible. At a physiological level, at a psychological level, it is like a wall and a barrier. Instead of looking at it as, oh, this is my gymnasium, like I'm gonna work with these feelings, they're gonna help me. So it's it's interesting. And you know, if we look at especially kind of this fear, I see it underlying, of course, our, our craving and our aversion. Right, we, we don't want to lose this thing that's so good and oh my God, I don't want that other thing that's so bad. We could kind of just hang out there for a long time, right? This ability to anticipate in the future our losses or our harms. It's kind of an incredible thing we can do. It, it's hypothesized. I, I don't know if it's true since we haven't figured out a way to really communicate with the more than human world of our animal friends, but that we are the only species that can anticipate, that can imagine, and that can really in the future imagine our fear and kind of worry and worry. So this famous book title, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky kind of just says it all. Right, the zebra who almost got attacked and killed by a lion at the watering hole yesterday isn't stressed about it today. It's like, that happened yesterday. I'm good. Um, and that's not us, right? We are at the water hole, at, like anticipating a bigger pack of lions, right? Or maybe we don't even go to the water hole, watering hole. So it's so interesting how all these pieces fit together of being, you know, kind and open with the reality of fear, and also trying to train our mind to not be so susceptible to succumbing to fear. Um, curious, oh, I think I see a hand raise. I'm so glad I s still have some eyesight left. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to point out, Jonathan wrote in the chat, false events appearing real. Fear. False events appearing real, yeah, yeah. Other, yes. Having second thoughts, how you to try to synthesize them. Really appreciate that invitation of like, if you're worried, if you're afraid, like oh, you're not alone. And that automatically invites a kind of joy 
to remember, right? Mm. All of us just want to feel like we belong, are connected. Mm. Yeah. And but it so it does a lot of things at once, where it mm. connects us to ourselves, which is often the place that we're most separate, but we project it out. But then it also connects like to you who said it, to the teachings, to this lineage, to the practice, like to the Dharma, mm-hmm. right? It's like all of these things. Mm. And that experience is joyful, even with the fear. And mm. I'm realizing that one of the reasons maybe we don't talk about joy or talk about fun is because it's really subtle <laughs> and it's soft. And it's not the way that we think about joy. Right? We think about like oh, joy <laughs> when we have experiences of joy in in our inside, in our compassion, mm. it's quiet. Yeah. It's not often like oh, right? Even mm. it's one of the biggest insights we've ever had. I don't know, maybe other people have a different experience, but yeah. for myself, any joyful moment has been really like Held, it's like, mm. like, um, it's like a tiny, enormous thing, mm. and it's not how we talk about joy or experience it. And I think we're also, as a culture, um, and maybe it's somatic as well, because fear we think about fear as being more alert, whereas joy is like having a guard down, mm. right? Right, so and if it's like if we're not afraid, we're not paying attention, if we're happy. Something must be wrong. Mm-hmm. We're going to lose it, right? You know, so it, there's a lot of um, intricacy to both of those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah, I'm going to try to do a little bit of justice to that. It was, you know, the first um, piece was really reflecting on that invitation that when we feel fear, we can recognize we're not alone. And that creates a sense of connection to these teachings, to each other, um, and that just core sense of belonging that we all have, that we all need. And that a a lot of our fear is that sense of of not belonging. And that possibly um, part of the reason joy isn't so emphasized or understood or disseminated in these teachings is there's a subtlety to it that in our contemporary culture, we think of joy as, you know, your pyrotechnic uh, gender reveal party. Um, I don't know where that came from. Sorry, guys. It's been a long day. <laughs> no, those are my words. Um, you know, it's not this big thing. It's, um, it's something that can be really subtle. And that even when having a huge insight, it's not, again, like fireworks per se. But it's this really like beautiful feeling. I, when you were speaking about the insight, it, it is it's such a unique feeling that like it's like almost like ah, like oh, and even if it's the same insight over it, which it is over and over and over and over, um, it's such a relief and. Yeah, it's, you know, when we think of enjoyable emotions, it has the biggest range of any of the family of emotions, including relief, including bliss. Um, So I I like that idea of like cultivating um, a palette where we can actually appreciate different forms of joy that might be more subtle. Um, Yeah, and of course, I, I think Ryan, probably also had some, at some point come to his mind, I, I do think of the Dalai Lama when I think of a joyful uh, practitioner, uh, and Chandra, um, who laughs a lot when she teaches, and it's great, and there is, you know, this buoyancy, and it doesn't mean that we become kind of bubbly and vapid, right? There's, we can be in the depths of our difficulties, and also be with the joy that's there for us. Other thoughts, questions, reflections? Online crew, come on, we want to hear from you. I see Claudia leaning in. <laughs> I know Claudia. Yeah. Hi. 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 Yeah. Hi. Well, okay, since you're inviting, um, I was just thinking, um, Today, I was talking with a younger uh, man and he was saying that he was uh, 
worried that sometimes he starts thinking what if and whatever and I told him from my experience that sometimes when I have negative thoughts and I realize that I'm going to go down the rabbit hole uh, I do start thinking about beautiful things and then really um, focusing on my breath and trying to bring myself back to the present and that really helps me and tonight during the um, meditation uh, Ryan it was wonderful i was actually feel, i've been having issues with my blood pressure and my heart was actually feeling a little contracted and when you started guiding us through like relaxing and feeling the good parts in our body and tight and whatever and uh eventually it did get softer and uh i was just it was bliss really i mean i was i was so relaxed like there's nowhere to go, nothing to do. And it's just like, <laughs> yeah, just like what you described. So thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because there's, there's kind of these two things that are going on from the fear perspective that I want to comment on. Um, one of them is, I'm on this whole idea, this whole thing about culture, like the conditions, right? What generates the conditions of fear? Mm. And certainly, we just have, obviously, that's just something in us, right? Fear is this primordial sort of emotion, right? Um, and we also, in the United States, we have a culture that actually promotes the conditions of fear, right? So that's like, a factor. And then another thing about it is um, another thing our culture does is it keeps us super busy all the time, mm. right? Like consumerism and the whole like subplot really is to keep us afraid, I think. Mm. Like the whole, the, there's a cultural ethic of that for various reasons. So I just think that's important to mm. comment on so that we can um, rattle that a little bit. Um, like there, are, it is a primordial emotion, and then there are these sort of headwinds that mm. perpetuate that in us. And part of that, I think, the reason I want to say that is because um, it's nice to sometimes just be like, "Oh, it is me, and it's not me." <laughs> this fear actually is driven by these outside factors. Yes, there is primordial fear of like, "Oh, dude, here comes the car," and I'm like in the middle of a crosswalk. So wherever I am, I gotta get out of the way. That's like a certain kind of fear. And then there's just like this other. Yeah. So, but why I want to comment on those is because I think it's important. Um, probably, I've missed some meditation, but probably I'm different people commented on it. And um, I was recently on a retreat and I experienced experience this thing that meditation does. Why is it so great? Like why do I teach me out here over and over or wherever showing up to meditate? Is it slows slows things down. And we have this opportunity, I think, to um I end up having the opportunity to experience joy in the most simple Things like kind of like what mm. the person is commenting on. Like, um, we can become a little bit more embodied and a little bit more present if we have slowed it down. Mm. And then we can notice, like, how good it feels to. I mean, I don't even know. I was like riding me, you're riding the bar, and um, it just like. Super good, right? Bart, because that's, that's unusual. <laughs> no, it was a newer, it was one of the newer trains, but it's truly even if it's not newer trains. Like, you're just kind of standing there, and then all of a sudden, this incredible momentum just like, hey, it's and like, you know, that feels good. <laughs> You're like, yeah, that's my car goes back. That. <laughs> that just feels good, and it's, it's nothing, you know, or like, I just sometimes just like, Walking, you're just like mm. you're just walking, but if you're in body, perhaps then um, you can feel like how your foot like touches the ground, like 
maybe it's the cement or maybe it's the grass or whatever, and that actually feels good, hmm. right? And that's what I think I've been experiencing here and there that um, helps kind of like, the joy isn't like this fantasy, you know? Joy is just like, ah, oh, the water comes out of the tap. Like, let's really sing about that because that's cool. If we are not taking the buckets, or maybe that'd be nice to take the buckets off and enjoy the heaviness of it. I don't know. But you don't, you don't, you don't have to come up with that. I should stop now. No, I'd love that. <laughs> Could you all hear? Should I repeat? Happy to repeat or try to repeat. Yes, repeat. So the, the first part, which I loved, was a bit of a, um, because I, I always love a good rant on capitalism, um, was <laughs> identifying that the fear is something we experience primordially, meaning we can all have a susceptibility to fear when, you know, our life is being threatened, something's, you know, about to hit us or is running after us. But there's also the fear that is truly cultivated by our contemporary culture creating a culture of need and of scarcity, of feeling like we need more. I think greed, this is my commentary, but greed is so related. You know, I, I often think of if we could antidote greed with a sense of just basic okayness, there would be enough, there already is enough to go around, you know, and how do we, how do we help people feel what you then described as just this joy of being? Like if we have a joy that we can kind of feel into through our dharma practice of just slowing down and being enjoy and feeling enjoyable experiences and then kind of um, unbelievably described a joyful experience of just being on bart which a lot of us had a hard time relating to <laughs> but i aspire to no i as I a really... tourist it really <laughs> inspires me to go buy a bar ticket right after this going under the tunnel is cool <laughs> going under going under the bay you're just like i'm under the bay so how can we bring that kind of you know that real freshness um and it is true slowing down you know being being fortunate to be in this retreat setting where we have a very regular schedule um, and we're not going very many places. I've noticed so many different things about the couple trees that are just like outside of the center. And today I was like, oh my God, there are blossoms on that tree. I'd missed it the first three days. Just amazing. And just, yeah, a lot of joy. A lot of different sense of joy, but it's it's tough. It's transitioning. What did Alan used to say? Transitioning from coal to solar. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember that analogy he talked about? What was it for? What it was right? Yeah, it's it has to do with, uh, and and I think it speaks really to the point that it can be so subtle at first when we start to kind of shift from the like really kind of poignant, exaggerated, pleasant experiences that are being dished up around us, that there's a whole industry, in fact, to, to give us this kind of like turn the volume all the way up on these temporary joys. And when we compare that to the joy of being, it's so subtle. Mm. And so it's like we've, the, the analogy is like we've been burning coal and all the, the kind of emissions from burning the coal have blocked the sun. And, you know, someone down the road hears about solar, you know, and so they, they put a, a solar system on top of their roof. And at first, because, you know, all those emissions are there and that it, it takes a while, but it, it starts working just a little bit. Yeah. And we start to see, okay, I can feed myself this way. I can, there is this kind of other alternative source of energy that I can start to tap into, but it takes some time because mm -hmm. we're so used to the like joy being so exhilarating and riveting, you know? And we, we forget that this authentic joy that comes really from these experiences of like just the simplicity of being mm -hmm. or, you know, the, the fact that we have tap water you know, and these little things you pointed out to, these little nuances, they they actually go a long way. Mm. You know, I was just thinking tonight when Eve, you know, was 
has told me so much about this group. And I was thinking, gosh, this is like, this is like Eve's Kula. This is like her, <laughs> her tribe. I'm like, I better not screw it up. <laughs> and so immediately. You the, still have the, a couple, you have 10 yeah, minutes left. <laughs> almost, almost made it through. <laughs> but one of the things that I did, my dirty little secret is, um, the joy I feel right now in my butt against this soft chair <laughs> has been like, just been the, you know, like, ah, oh, I can be here with these people. I'm not going to screw it up. You know, and after all, I'm sitting in this soft chair and all of a sudden, you know, it's that falling again, that breaking open, that I can be here. I can be open, receptive mm. and, you know, switching from, from coal to solar and really just trusting in the, the subtlety and that a little bit goes along, it can go a long way. Mm. And the thing, you have a little, another different kind of dirty secret. We like our fear. We like our fear. It's kind of comfortable. It's like, if I'm not worried about something, I need to find something to worry about. And it's, it's quite interesting. It gives us a sense of being in control, maybe being able to anticipate the future. And so there's this way that like, even though being anxious, you know, is not great, it feels productive. Is that what it is? Right. I, I see some heads nodding. There's just this way that we, um, we get kind of habituated to that way of, of being and it can be hard to reset and, and to put things down. And we know at any moment we can pick up a device and reactivate our worry. And it's, it's hard to be on our own with our own experiences that are moving and shifting. And what I also notice about fear is it's, it feels like it can get really tight before it opens back up, right? So it's like this, oh, this, I'm really nervous. I'm really, and then there's a opening. But if we don't allow ourselves to feel the opening, which is literally just the natural wave of an emotion that will rise and fall, and we distract ourselves or we push it away, we don't get to feel that. And so we think we always need to distract or we always need to fix or do. And we don't just let ourselves naturally feel fear. When I have been on a longer retreat and able to, to be with the entire experience of fear as it comes and goes, a couple times, not all the time, I just experience it as energy. You know, it's not like, oh, because what I've noticed too is since myself really habituated with these kind of uh, sense of anxiety is I can even have a sense of anxiety before I have a trigger for it feel anxious. Then I'm like, what is it? Oh, it's that. Okay. Yeah. That's, ooh, that's a good one. Right. And so how do you work with the energy, even that's arising before you have the trigger? There's other things that immediately trigger us to fear, but there's just a lot to observe and look at that experience. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So fear motivates us. It helps us get shit done. And I'd say like a kind of a key principle in, in cultivating emotional balance that is drawing a lot from contemplative science is there's no emotions that are bad or wrong. There's none that are negative. What we want is to respond to them in a constructive way. So if we recognize that fear of, wow, I didn't get that thing done. I said I was going to get done. And if I don't, I might lose my job. That's a reasonable fear. It might be right. But how do we respond? Do we stay up all night, binge watching, whatever, um, and then wake up feeling totally unequipped to get the work done we need to get done. So it's more, do we feel that fear and be like, I actually need to go to bed early. I got to turn off everything and just get some sleep so I can handle this tomorrow. It's how we respond and kind of cultivating our awareness enough to recognize we're fearful so we can choose wisely. Yeah. We have time for like one or two more questions, comments. Oh, yes. I keep thinking about um, 
I often think of the examples of joy as like inherently kind of pleasant things or even sort of neutral things. Mm. And that when we're talking about fear and joy, that like equanimity keeps coming up for me, where, and like Ram Das is ah, uh, so, right? <laughs> you got an ice cream cone, ah, uh, so. Your friend has cancer, ah, uh, so. Mm. To be able to, and, and also thinking about, I sat two weeks on retreat and had some of the darkest things come up and was also able mm. in my talking about these like awful things, I was laughing in this recognition of the, the power of being able to mm. actually sit those things and it was not it wasn't even like the, the things were unpleasant but the experience of awareness of the things was maybe not even enjoyable but just kind of ah this mm. right and you can take that as what that like subtle joy and it was almost even like i think i was laughing because i was like oh this is kind of fun now <laughs> right? all the shit can be kind of fun now yeah um and that's mm. yeah but there like and any of the things right get to be mm. fun joy the practice yeah yeah oh well, it's gonna be a really hard one to repeat um very beautiful reflection on recognizing that the joy and the fear aren't necessarily maybe so separate. And this practice from Ram Das of also, ah, whether it's an ice cream cone or a terminal diagnosis of a friend, just here it is, or ah, so. And that in even being in dark and difficult times on retreat, where a lot of dark material comes up, which it really does sometimes, to be able to laugh at that and feel even the joy with that. Just, it's such a, such a powerful way to see. Uh, again, I just think about you describing the pure land as everywhere around you, mm -hmm. right? You know, I think that was maybe a month ago, but it really stuck with me, right? Walking down the street here, already the pure land. So that we are talking and getting to that, not just conceptual, but experiential, glimpse of non-duality in which all the joys and the sorrows are dancing, maybe having fun together, which is beautiful. Um, yeah, it, it really reminded me, I, I had a, also very dark experiences on retreat, and I remember um, really being in this big spin about how I hadn't done enough, and maybe one day I could prove myself, and it was kind of like running in the background, and I'd catch it, and then it would come back, I'd catch it, and then I just had this thought like, wait, what if I'm already okay? And I was just like, I was like, had to run out of the Dharma hall. Go, this is hilarious. I mean, it just was just so funny that that hadn't crossed my mind once. And uh, yeah, I did get quite a bit of joy from that. Maybe we take a moment with that to dedicate the merit of our practice. So just returning to that beautiful invitation to be in the body and relax in the body. And reminding ourselves of the true purpose of our practice here together to cultivate that heart and path of the Bodhisattva Considering if there's anything we've touched into tonight that feels beneficial with our heart and symbolically offering any merit, any benefit from our time together, that it could be of service to support this outrageous and essential aspiration that all beings could be free, all beings could know peace and ease, all beings could know belonging. So 
so wonderful to be with you all. Thank you, Ryan, for joining us. Come again soon. Thanks for not booting me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Oh, and I'll, I'll be here next week. We're going to keep on the steam a little while of using four measurables and emotions. So next week we'll be doing sadness and equanimity. And then the following week, compassion and anger. Why not? <laughs> so, yeah, so I'll be here next week. And then Venerable Tenzin Chioki, who some of you have also sat with, will be here doing compassion and anger. She will be online with us. But, yeah. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, all the volunteers and board. We are so grateful for you making this space possible for us. And thank you to both of you for coming from the retreat and bringing us joy. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.